Please send John your MP3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, FLB, or SWIFT file of your midterm so he can upload it to the index. And by sending it to John, you're granting permission for it to be uploaded. Please don't forget to introduce yourself when you do your tutorial. Um, and again, this all needs to be submitted tonight, including to the forum, by 11 p.m. tonight. Okay? Um, these are all the assignments we have yet to do for the semester, as you can see. And um, they're going to come screaming fast on us. So telling a story with line waiting to the fifth is probably too late. So I'm going to keep amping them forward. And these deadlines, by the way, are the deadline closing window. They're not the late deadline. In other words, when I say they're due today, like letter forms is due today, you'll notice that you have exactly one week before the window of letter forms closes. And what that means is today's the date it's due. Your one week grace period for late submissions is today to next week. After the 9th, there will be no submissions because they will be beyond a week late. Does everybody follow that? Oh, I thought it was just, oh, well, we're just going to do it in class now and then. Yeah. No, just so, you, <laughs> just so you know. Because once the window closes, you can't upload. And I won't have a way to receive your submission when the window closes. All right? Yes? Um, on time as in noodles. So, but I mean after that. So there's no right. Like once a week is passed. Once the deadline window closes in Moodle, you may not submit it to Moodle anymore. Right. It's, so you don't accept anything past that. Right. Because today, for example, for the letter forms, your assignment is due. We're reviewing it. You have a week to finish it up. Sometimes you fall behind. You can't. You could get the final product in, but you haven't put together your PDF of all your process. Sometimes that takes a while to accumulate or reflect on, or maybe you want to revise it. That's the other part I hope for. I hope for after we have the critique, you look at it and say, oh, I know exactly how to improve it, because if I improve it now, you'll see more process in my PDF submission. And in addition, you'll see a better finished product in my portfolio. But those are both the goals. Just showing your best work. And, and policy is, policy is that for department policy is everything in order to get a 100% grade you need to submit by the deadline. And, um, and you have one week to submit the work late and then you cannot <clears throat> resubmit it ever again, and you can only get up to, I think, 80% grade, I think is what the policy is. Yes, Trevor? So can they do that? Submit it late? We, yeah, so that we would get at least like 80. You're saying that we can't submit it at all. What I just said a second ago, right here, and I stick to policy, I stick to pol I, I think I'm far more generous than the policy, personally, because I think life is, you know, we all have lives. Um, here's the department policy for grading, and it mostly becomes relevant less for this class. Actually, for the media design class, I never allowed any late work, period. You missed the Moodle window, you are so done. So what I did is I kept the Moodle window open a week longer so everybody could load their work. That's, and what happens is I find that when students submit late work, they're so busy chasing after their late work that they're not present with what we need to be present with. That's what I find. And what I will tell you, if there's work that you didn't submit to Moodle that did not get graded, um, you're, it does not mean you're off the hook from submitting the work because your portfolio will only be complete if you have submitted all projects, not exercises, projects. And for this semester, we've got nine projects, I believe, maybe eight. Um, and you need to have all eight projects in order to even have the opportunity to receive 100% on your portfolio. And your portfolio, there is no late submission, period. So if, for example, you had a rough semester and you didn't make the deadlines or you skipped a project because you just were burned out and you planned on making it up later, 
you cannot make it up later, submit it to me late, and have me grade it for that project. Um, but I will grade it for the portfolio, and it will make your portfolio all-inclusive. And your portfolio grade is weighted at, um, your portfolio is 15% of your grade, which is a lot, a lot. Your participation is 10%. That's a lot. Your being here, being present, being part of critiques, that's, you've already got 25% of your grade based on your portfolio and your participation. Your exercises are 10% and your projects, these eight or nine projects we were talking about, are 65% of your grade. They're pretty heavily weighted. You miss one, you're losing, I don't know, what is that, 8%, 8% 8 of your grade. So hopefully that helps you understand it. And there's also a cutoff, like if you missed projects previously that you wanted to redo. Um, John and I will certainly receive redos. Here's the policy regarding redo. You can't do redo a project that hasn't been submitted on time. That's one of the department policies. Any project submitted on time is eligible, eligible for a redo. It's eligible for a redo of up to 90 percent of your grade. That's department policy. In reality, these grades are just a, a trick to get people to do the work. The real, the only important thing is that you understand the processes and are able to do it. That's what's really important, not the grades. Um, that's the real life conversation, yes. The real life conversation, as John says, which I'm repeating for the video, is um, you get, you get a grade and you have a deadline to keep you basically on task. Although if you're applying to a four-year college, you can't write on your application, I understood all the work. I'm sorry I have Fs. <laughs> right? You can't do that. But, um, but So if there's work that you want to redo and the windows close, like there's an exercise you did um, wrong and so you got a zero on it and you want to resubmit it and, it, and um, you still have time to do that, resubmit it. John, I'll regrade it. I'll regrade it. If you want to improve a project that you've gotten your grade on, I would say that most people are so successful in this class with their projects. You're all fantastic. I really have to say that. I think that most of you are probably pretty happy with your grades because you've done a terrific job. Everybody's been very conscientious. Um, if you wish to improve your project as part of your portfolio, I would say after the critique, I didn't resubmit it for the project grade, but I did, re, I did revise it for the portfolio because I want to look my best. I don't want to put in mediocre work in my project, in my portfolio. I wanted, it to, I wanted to make those improvements. And tell me that when you submit your portfolio because I take that into consideration. I know it's really time consuming to improve it. And like I said, if you've missed projects for grading, um, do them. Put them in your portfolio so your portfolio is complete. It's incredibly important to do that. I definitely take that into consideration, okay? I also take into consideration if they're missing. If they miss anything, yeah. Did that thoroughly answer you, Skylar? Yeah? Okay. Um, and probably everybody else, too. So now we have a new project which um, says it's due on the 16th, and what's today, the 2nd. So we're going to have um, probably a week and a half for this project, which is called Textures. And I introduced it to you, I introduced it to you before spring break, because I wanted you to follow up the texture lecture we had and start opening your eyes and looking at the world of textures. And who was it? Um, Albin, you're here, right? Albin, you did your beautiful lumberjack poster, and you put all these wonderful patterns in and changed them. And it's so funny because it reminded me of what people sometimes submit for the texture project. The texture project is designed to do kind of what Emil did with us today by pulling down those beautiful tiger stripes that added fur and, and a, a feel to his project. So your texture project is three parts, and in order to get that, that heroic 70% grade, 70 points, 
um, in your grading, you have to have all three parts. And they're each weighted. I'd say that um, it's basically 20, 25, 25, 25 for your project. So you have the first part of your project is um, first thing you're going to do is you're going to start to consider textures and you're going to consider how we create textures two-dimensionally. And what that means is with this flat computer screen, what's communicating texture? I don't know if you can see this right here. This was so fantastic. The first semester I, I taught this class with this project, I kept emphasizing to students presentation is everything. And I obviously haven't done it as much since. I used to have students bring in hanging mobiles. You know what I'm talking about? Like Calder mobiles. And this student took foam core that was black and she covered it with tooling, you know, bridal veils, the white netting. It's called tooling. And she found brown tooling and she cut niches into um, the outside of this oval cut foam core board and she wrapped her tooling on it and then she mounted her texture which was a mask. She decided to draw a mask and in each of those color areas, what you can't see very well, is textures are embedded in there. And then she brought it and she mounted it on the wall and it looked like a huge um, uh, palm tree um, Husk, that's the word I'm looking for. It looked like a huge palm tree or coconut husk that had a mask mounted on it. It was beautiful. It was very tactile. And so her texture project had texture. And it was extraordinary. And so that had three-dimensional texture. And what you're going to start to do with this project is figure out how to enrich um, the feel of your graphics by adding texture to the background. And some of you in your color posters <coughs> did that. Some of you had, um, I want to, um, Miki, I think yours had, did you have texture in the background of yours? Of your poster, your color poster? Or is it just the photograph? There was no texture. But the elements, right. Well, so the idea is, is that you're going to create a texture library because I was looking at this artist down. Oh, I think he's in the texture. He's in the texture lecture. I don't want to go to that. Um, let's see what this is. Oh, okay. Um, there was an artist who created this huge texture library for himself. So all of his graphics. Um, he had them at his fingertips to work with. And I found a long time ago, kind of interestingly, um, that, that it's really valuable to have when, I'm going to tell you a little life story, one of my digressions, it won't be that long, um, which is this. When my daughter was little, like preschool little, I used to love the artwork that she she'd bring, here we go, books, that's what I want. I, I'd love the artwork she'd bring home, and um, so I'd scan it, because, you know, when you're in preschool, that you do everything on that really um, cheesy newsprint paper that crumples after two years, it gets old and dry, and it's awful. And I thought, oh, how do I preserve this? So how I used to preserve her artwork was, I used to scan it, and create a digital file of it. And then I had a project to create a book cover. And it was about planning, which, um, forgive me, but planning's kind of dry. And um, so I thought, OK, I'm going to create, I'm going to take some images. This is actually kind of interesting for this project. But I'm going to take some photographic images. And you know, a suburban house is a little boring. And these are um, power poles and high rises. And this is a um, uh, site plan, right? A site rendering for a new community. And what I did is I needed to add some texture and depth to it. So I took the site plan and I um, scanned it. And then my daughter, I always call it the Rothko period. Anybody know who Rothko is as a painter? He's a modern artist. Nobody? Raise your hand if you do. OK. All right. Rothko. Rothko is one of my favorites. Um, 
this is Rothko, images of Rothko. And I used to go to the museum with my daughter and we'd walk and look at all the Rothko pictures like this one. And she'd try to understand it and I'd say, oh yes, he was happy that day. Sun was out. And then Zelda. He broke up with Zelda that day, so he became very blue. And we'd have these conversations because, you know, artists are people. And what I love about Rothko is you take this solid area of blue, and it's blue and it's yellow and it's orange, and it's got this feeling to it, right? It's very rich. So when my daughter did her painting, and she was two in preschool, and she had taken the paintbrush out of the blue container and painted an entire blue painting. Some kid had accidentally, prior to that, put the red brush in the blue container, which made this uneven color of reds and blues, kind of like this Rothko, for example. And it was quite beautiful. It was just rich blue with more wonderful color. So what I did was I took the scan of her painting. I took the scan of the um, site plan. And I merged them together, right, and overprinted them. Other things you could do to add texture to pictures is right here. There's a whole set of Photoshop artistic um, choices. Didn't somebody do a video, uh, interim on filters in Photoshop? No? Someone. Yeah, yeah, you did. Right, Anton did. Okay, so I applied probably paint daubs, which is a filter in Photoshop to make things look um, like watercolor. So the goal of what this texture project is for all of you is you're going to accumulate handmade textures and you're going to accumulate digital textures and you're going to make what I call texture quilts. And you're going to make huge textures, not little three inch squares. The textures you're going to show on your texture quilt are going to be three inches. But my goal, hopefully for all of you, is that you make huge, at least, at least eight and a half by eleven textures, and then you scan them. So it's a lot of work, which is why I wanted you to get started on it. You can certainly take a digital picture of it, but you're going to have to clean up your digital picture of your handmade textures. And then you think, how do you make handmade textures? Well, Remember when you were kids and you used to take crayons and do rubbings of things? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, so I want you to look at the world like you, like you were a kid again and look for textures. I don't care if you do them all in one color. I don't care if you get a black stick of charcoal and you rub the bottom of your shoes and you put a bunch of coins and you rub a bunch of coins or you rub the vinyl that's on the cork board here, or you go to the concrete, all the little holes in the sidewalk, and you rub it, or you go to a brick wall and you rub it. I want you to accumulate textures, because these textures are going to have, um, there's going to be a time and a place where they're going to feel valuable to use them. Um, here, let's see. And then, so you're going to make a texture quilt out of at least 16 textures that are handmade. And then you're going to make a texture quilt out of digital textures. And I don't care if we took Emile's um, uh, tiger, his Photoshop, oh, did, was it on your zip drive? Is that why? You think? There. Okay, so you can digitally take an image and start to play and figure out how to create texture. I mean, you could easily, this is about exploration for all of you. You can go to the filter gallery and you could take this and see what kind of texture you create. It could be an abstract photograph or you could take all your rubbings and you can colorize them or you can turn them into watercolors or it doesn't, I don't really want a recognizable image for your texture, but you know, and obviously there's a control panel here where you can totally um, obliterate whatever your image is. But start to play and accumulate digital textures. You can also just, um, you can go to the internet, like you saw Emil had found a whole library of free downloadable textures. You can go to the internet and type in um, public domain texture. And then you want to go for high resolution 
let's see, here's a WordPress, let's try the first one. And you want to make sure that you're getting high resolution images, but look at all these beautiful textures. And you'll find some with marble, and you'll find some with, um, you'll find anything you can imagine. Think about it, anything you can imagine. And download textures, yes. So, um, if I was to take a picture of something like this, could that be the handmade texture? No. Or do I have to make it myself? It literally, handmade means handmade. I've had well, people... I mean, it's handmade. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, I know. Somebody laid those stones in there a long time ago. Yes, that's true. <laughs> but, you know, I had students really have a good time with this. I had students um, open their cosmetic drawer and take out all of their cosmetics and paint with them and smear with them. I had people open their kitchen cabinets and sprinkle out all their herbs on paper and photograph it for texture or I had students take tomatoes and drop them into the ground and grab the texture of the seeds and the splat. The idea is to start creating a library for yourself so you have high resolution graphics that are that have depth and tactile quality to it. That's the goal, tactile quality. And digitally, you know, we can take these. This is kind of, you know, this is a found texture, but I could easily in Photoshop, um, you know, fill this right now with black, right? And, um, and then go in and play with some weird filter or just paint, you know, let's Let's squiggle with red, and I, and I don't really want to do this, but um, I, don't, I don't want to waste a lot of time. But you could do this and then go to the filter gallery and see what happens when you turn this into a mosaic texture or something texture. Was that Steve or Jonathan back there? Um, um, or do you animate, so say I can work in a special wall or something, but I just need to do the whole thing to cut that out of the screen? Yeah, yeah. It's not hard. I mean, it's a little time-consuming it's actually fun um, and then you have to figure out whether you want a flatbed scan it or you want a digital photo of it the problem if you take a digital photo of capturing your handmade texture is I find that most um, novices if you're not if you're new to Photoshop and scanning I mean I'm sorry if you're new to digital cameras you're gonna get weird lighting that you're going to have to color correct in Photoshop anyway. So scanning is usually an easier thing to do. Well, but what if I take like a tomato and drop it on a piece of paper? What do I, I can't really scan it. Um, let it dry. <laughs> let it dry and you can scan it. Absolutely. And actually pull the tomato away and it's going to be what's left behind that's going to be interesting. And that let it dry. And you can scan it. Yes. And so, um, yes. Depends on what you do with them. The herbs, if you end up rubbing over them, that's handmade. If you um, photograph the stack of herbs, the big pile of herbs, that's digital. Because you're just photographing it, basically. But the idea is to build texture libraries for yourself. And the minimum is 16 of each. If you're incomplete with that, you, um, you're incomplete. And then what you're supposed to do, and everybody forgets this, they get so involved with a texture quilt um, that they forget to sketch what the subject matter is that's authentic to their portfolio, what's authentic to their message. Um, they forget to do sketches of the composition that they plan out here. So, oh, this is disappointing that I did that. Um, let me see what I've downloaded here for examples, just so we can start to kind of look through it. Um, here we go. So one of the things you can do in, in Acrobat Professional, when you're in Acrobat Professional, after you've put your texture quilt together, is there's a little sticky note um, tool. So one of the things that's fun about this is knowing what the heck your texture is and keeping track of it and making a note with a sticky note of what they are. Kind of fun, right? So these are um, digital textures and it's a great example of how you can document what you did. 
And let's see what this one is. Um, this, <laughs> this student, this student went crazy. They love their textures. They took rolls and rolls of film. I, actually, it's digital camera, so it wasn't rolls of film. They took photos and photos and photos. And um, then they documented them. And then they took their photograph of the texture and that they found, and they digitally manipulated it using filters and documented it. Because what if you get a super cool effect like the tutorials you learned from? What if you did a super cool effect and you don't know what the heck you did? So she documented it um, for herself. It's your reference. And, um, and then she was a, a fine artist also. And here's some beautiful textures she created using watercolors and rubbings and ink um, and um, you know cheesecloth. You can see. You could take fabric. You could take fabric. You can dip it in tea. You could take your tea bag. Anybody who drinks tea, you can take your tea bag and just dunk it on a piece of paper when you're done. And then you can take the tea leaves out of the tea bag and then scatter them on a piece of paper, mash them down, and pull them away, and you've got another texture, right? I mean, knock yourself out. Go play with your food, right? Um, I mean, have fun with this. The idea is create texture, create beautiful libraries that you enjoy the process. And then the student said, okay, what do I want to do? What's authentic to my message? And she, it was a self-portrait. And so she started doing her thumbnail sketches. Don't forget, that's still part of your process. And then she did her sketch of what composition she wanted to make, and she executed it. She drew her vector shape. She placed, remember like that type exercise? She placed the digital image in it. And she said, here it is. Love it. It's great. And I said, well, it's, it's good. Could you make it richer? The idea of textures is layering and doing layer um, blending modes. And so she started to play with motion blur, thankfully, because she took, um, who did the tutorial? Where are you? Jonathan's tutorial on motion blur. So she took her textures, and then she did motion blur. And she brought it into Photoshop. And then she added textures behind it. And then she played with layer blending modes. And then she added more textures behind it and different layer blending modes to get a richer image. And then she set it on a background because presentation's everything and presented it that way. And then here's her texture quilts. So you can get a feel for what the goal of this is. Now she has a texture library of 32 textures, hopefully that she loves. And you know, I have one student I had from semesters back who all she did was textures. All of her artwork, that's why Alvin, yours seemed familiar to me. All of her artwork incorporated textures and patterns. And it enhances the tactile quality of two-dimensional graphics. See what this one is. Yeah, Steve. Uh, when you said like 16 of each, do you mean like 16 handmade, 16 like hand bound? Or? Yes. So like on the internet? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Yeah.
it doesn't have to represent anything. If you want to do beautiful abstract because that's what you love, do abstract. That's okay. But you do need to make your final composition a blending of digital and handmade textures. Okay? Um, there's beautiful examples. This student, I, let's see. I'm going to see if I downloaded that. Did I do all these already? I did them. I'll let you finish downloading them. This student, for example, wanted to recreate the cover for a Boston album. This student, um, this was one of the first semesters. This one's beautiful. I, I thought I downloaded this one. It's huge. I've never seen anything like this. He added special effects to it. He used textures. He colored things. Um, see it's still downloading. You can see it's huge. This student um, wanted to, his portfolio was about world hunger, basically. And so he took a photograph that came from a world hunger, um, what was it? What do I want to say? It was a documentary image, um, photo, photojournalistic image about world hunger and all those faces are filled with food. Right? And talk about making the message more meaningful. Um, let me go back to that. Oh, hold on. This one's beautifully planned. Let me see if this one downloads too. Let's go to the downloads folder. Um, I think this is only partially downloaded. Here it is. There we go. Um, so again, I'm not going to go through those. You can do this. But he thought to sketch thumbnails, right? Don't forget that part. Plan on what it is you wish to say. And then he drew all this. It was insane, to be honest. He had, I've, I've never, it probably was hundreds of hours. I'm sure of it. And you can see how he started to build his graphics. You could see how many layers he had in his artwork. But the end result, when you look at it and you come to realize that it's created by using textures, adds to the surrealistic quality. If you like surrealism, man, this knocks your socks off, right? Plus, look at the point of view. The point of view isn't like straight on uh, carnival. It's from the ground. It's from somebody laying on the grass looking up, right? You know, he's, he's a discarded popcorn container on the ground or something. So it's, it's extraordinary. And um, let me see what else got downloaded here. This one. What's this one? This one was very thoughtfully designed and very straightforward graphics of um, the savanna and a safari. And again, research, brainstorming, thinking about what his intention is planning very carefully what he was going to use and where. And he, he chose textures um, that had color tones that he was going to work with for this. And you can see how it's being built. It's quite extraordinary, right? It's beautiful. And again, that's by creating a shape. It's by changing the opacity or the transparency um, or the layer blending mode of it. And you can see that you couldn't fill that with flat color and have the same effect, right? It's beautiful. So, um, so think about, again, what you want to say. And, and think that you're building a library for this. And um, I don't want to take up more time. I, I want to get to our letter forms. Because if you look right here, there's a video on how to place um, all your images as a texture quilt in a design. And on Monday, I'll help you do that. I, I want to send you off for the weekend. Um, just accumulating them all and planning what you want to do with it okay and I'll look at um, I'll look at our schedule and give you a specific due date for it um, so everybody's clear and here of course as usual are tons of tutorials on layer blending modes on clipping masks at this point in the semester you all have this stuff under your belt pretty much so you're in pretty good shape but there's lots of wonderful resources here on um, things that should help you. 
do keep in mind that when you're capturing your textures, always capture them at 300 pixels per inch. Okay? Any questions about this assignment for you? No? At least you know what you're going to be doing all weekend, right? Yeah? Does it look fun? Uh huh, it does, right? Really fun. All right. All right, so I'm going to stop our video and we're going to critique letter forms.